leadership is. With me today is Miss Doris Ako, the former Commissioner General of Uganda Revenue Authority and currently a partner with Denton. Denton's. Denton. She's a lawyer, an administrator. She's a leader who causes impact, the kind of leader who leaves a trail. And I was very honored when she accepted to come and sit with us here at Akili Africa, where you know that it's all about making African wisdom and intel intelligence prevalent so that the next generation of leaders know where to tap and get their source for what to do next. So, Madam Doris, thank you very much for coming. Um, I could say so much about you, but I'll say this one thing about you that has personally impacted me mm. and recently when I mentioned to someone and I was name, I was name dropping I said, huh, I'm hosting there is a call and, and this person said the humility of that lady is legendary mm. <laughs> and I want to say that that is the thing that inspires me the most about you because I remember the first time I met you physically uh, on our way home and as we were stopping at a petrol station I saw you at a dry cleaner, at a dry cleaner. and I said that looks like Miss Doris at home mm. and I said I will not let this opportunity to say hello pass okay. and I came and I introduced myself and we had a nice two three minute conversation mm -hmm. and when I've reached out to you, you've had the, the, the kindness and generosity of, of heart to reply, to respond. Even if it's after a week or two or a day or two, thank you very much because that sets a very high bar for me as an emerging leader. So, real quickly, I'd like you to introduce yourself, but introduce yourself in a way that you tell us these three things. What captures your heart? Mm. What makes you cry? Mm. And what drives you? Let us meet okay. Ms. Doe Sako. Thank you so much, uh, Ngozi, the solution, Matawa. I am very honored that you have deemed it fit that I should uh, sit in this chair. It's yours. Speak, it's yours. It's yours. Uh, and speak to you and speak to others about, you know, um, who knew, I can say, who knew that. Uh, <laughs> Doris at one time would be the person that uh, people would want to listen to. So thank you so much for the platform. My name is Doris, like you have said, Doris Akol. I'm a mother of three lovely boys biologically, and I mother many other children. A whole nation. Including, uh, I did mother a nation for five years, five and a half years. Yes. Um, but even before then, uh, many people know me because of those five and a half years. But mm. before then, I was working um, in URA for 19 and a half years before I became Commissioner General. And nobody knew me. 19 and a half years in obscurity. 19 and a half years doing um, legal work, legal advisory in tax and all that stuff that happens being a lawyer in a huge corporation like URA. And Basically, getting to do a lot of things uh, outside of work. Um, I, I am very passionate about making a difference. I'm very passionate about. In fact, I, 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 I tend to think my life, my life's principle, my life philosophy is about leaving people or leaving something better than I found it. I have to make a difference. I have to make 
um, I have to add value. I have to add value to people. I have to add value to situations and make them better than I found. And that's what maybe to us to answer the third part of the question. That's what drives me. I don't want to get into a situation, and I feel so bad. I feel so empty if I didn't make an impact. I didn't add value to it. So what drives me? Adding value. I'm very passionate about economic empowerment of women and girls. And I'll, I'll explain this. I believe that um, feminist theory, if it's not grounded in economic empowerment, becomes just feminism as a theory. Because women are able to make decisions when they have money of their own. When they are able to make financial decisions, then it becomes very easy for them to make other decisions. Do you consider yourself a feminist? I do. I do. Help us. Help us. A feminist is a person who puts women, or gender, particularly women issues, at the center of how you, you, you view life, or how you view uh, decision making, or how you view uh, difficult conversations, or how you view anything. You, 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 you always have the lenses of how it would impact women, how it would affect women, or how it can improve women, actually how it should improve women. So that's my so, work. Does that make me a feminist? Oh yes, it does. <laughs> you can be a feminist without knowing. So you can be a man feminist. and a feminist? Absolutely. There is feminism is not only for women. If you look Thank out you. for your daughters and you want to protect them and you want to make them their future better, you're a feminist. You're a feminist. If you don't differentiate between valuing boys and girls, you're feminist because that means you have, in your mind's eye, there is no difference between the genders. So that's feminism as, as well. That's being feminist centric. So there's someone who is wondering, what makes you cry? What makes me cry? Um, I, I, I don't like <coughs> injustice. Injustice. In whichever form it comes, injustice is, is a very bad thing. And injustice can manifest different ways. It mm. manifests in wrong, uh, basically, okay, I can give examples of injustice and, and, and uh, differentiating between people because of when you think or what you view their social status to be and making decisions because of, of, of that is injustice because maybe you will deny someone something because of what you view them to be. That's injustice. Taking decisions that are not grounded in law, I'm a lawyer. Taking decisions that are not grounded in law is injustice. When you de deliberately deny people what they're entitled to, that's injustice. When you, you, you disrespect people, that's injustice. When you, um, all forms of, 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 of things that would not pass the test of being just. I think is injustice. And there is a debate about context and all that, that's debate, but if you're not certain that the decision you made comes from a just place, then potentially it could be injustice and it could cause pain in various ways. It can cause physical pain, it can cause pain being a, a dis-ease, a dis-ease from from the, the, the what what should be. If you create a dis-ease from what should be, you cause pain. It may be physical pain when you pinch yourself and feel pain, but it can also be pain that manifests in different ways. So injustice makes me cry. And when I say cry, I, I don't technically mean the tears. Well, sometimes tears will come, but, but injustice is one of the things that I, 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 I would not like to be associated with. I have tried to live my life, um, both personally and professionally, not to create injustice. What else makes me cry? Dishonesty. Dishonesty, I, I, I do not like dishonesty in all forms. I do not like dishonesty. So dishonesty is one of the things that I uh, grieves me. And there is so much dishonesty. People have justified dishonesty in so many ways. And it justifies the means, you know, you've had those kind of mm. so, Dishonesty, in whichever ways it manifests, uh, whether at the market they they are supposed to sell something to you, a katasa of tomatoes typically goes for five thousand. Talk about lemons. Then, 
Yes, <laughs> that was during the, during the second wave. That's dishonesty. I mean, because if just three weeks ago you were selling katasa of lemon at 5K, then just because now the, the numbers of, or whatever have gone up, I mean, people who sold COVID decks at 85,000, mm -hmm. that's absolute dishonesty. It's terrible because you didn't buy it at that price. Everyone the person who's making it made it uh, available at 12K. So what's your justification for 85,000? It's, it's really... It's has, has anyone called you an idealist? Uh, sometimes I call myself that. An idealist. I, I, I don't, people don't have to tell me. Sometimes I think... So I how, as, I as a leader, how, how, do you, how do you reconcile your ideals with reality? Uh, you the, have to be pragmatic at times, but there are also there is also a certain level of non-negotiable where uh, you have to be very upfront about what is not negotiable, um, not negotiable levels of dishonesty. I mean, if I was the one, I mean, uh, the typical example I would give is that, uh, yes, people will tell you economics, the laws of demand and supply would make that cutters of lemons move up from, well, actually they were selling one lemon at 5,000 or something like that. Yeah. It's really bad. But the laws of economics, demand and supply, a, 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 a realist would tell you that, look, uh, yeah, that's, how it is. that's how it is. It is what it is. That's life. That's capitalism. And that's the, scene, that's the setting in which you're in. So, yes. It, it would grieve me, but I would actually realize that that's the, it is what it is. So today we're talking about leaders needed and uh, a case for mentoring the next transformational leaders for Africa. Okay. And we want to start with your journey to leadership. When did you discover that you're a leader? And, and how did you come to that realization? What happened? Because I, I realized that the schools that you went to are not far from the schools that I went to. You were in Amagunga, I was in Amiliango. Mm -hmm. So we had a relationship and we viewed ourselves as Ngonga, Ngonga and leaders. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, when did you discover that you are a leader? Um, I think snippets of my leadership began when I was in a level, probably in a level. And I guess um, the people who saw it in me gave me the opportunity, and maybe that is how it began. Because they gave a title? No. No, I wasn't any of those titles. But in the, in, in the, the classes that I was doing, I, I was the one that was selected to make the presentations, to, 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 to speak. You remember we used to go for, I don't know, what did they used to call them? Seminars. Seminars, yes. I was the one that had to make the presentations. I was the one that would always be given that, that obligation. Call it an obligation, call it an honor, call it whatever it is. But I wasn't a prefect as such. I wasn't a prefect, I wasn't, but I was singled out by my, my teachers then that if we want to do well at this seminar, you give Doris the, the, the one to, to, to make that presentation. So maybe someone saw that in me and gave me the platform. And, and um, So I would say maybe that is when I, I, I started coming through. Mm. If you say leader, leadership is part of getting out of the crowd and, and being at the forefront, maybe that is when I could say so. But in terms of leading people, leading people... Uh, I would say that happened well into my career, well into my career because I, I, I entered URA at pretty much entry level and grew in the ranks. So as I grew, I got additional responsibilities and that is how I began to lead people, I began to lead programs, I began to lead missions, I began to lead whatever. And progressively, I then began to lead, lead, lead leading divisions, leading departments and then ultimately leading the organization. So, yeah. So, so it's, it wasn't like a burning bush experience that, you know, you had a voice mm -hmm. saying, hey, Doris, mm -hmm. go and do this. But from what you're describing, it was incremental. It was incremental. I wasn't seeing it as that. But I think there are people who saw that in me. And uh, I don't want to call it a burning bush experience, but at a certain time, T I was groomed 
um, by by people who who said that the way she has come through she, the, the 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 ranks, she's a potential leader. Not for the organization, but she's a potential leader, and therefore I was given responsibilities responsibilities that would give me more knowledge or the the, the institution responsibilities that. Um, actually gave me decision-making uh, obligations, decision-making opportunities, decision-making strength. And uh, right from when I was um, early 30s, let me say, I was, leading, uh, I was leading a division, I was leading a functional area, I had my own budgets, I had my own strategies. So I guess and your own team. And I had my own team. And I guess that is how maybe the leadership bond began to be strengthened. And this comes through grooming. Otherwise, I want us to talk about, to talk that, about that. Because um, you've, you've talked a lot about growth, but the word that you've used there, grooming, mm. uh, for me speaks to mentorship, which is really the gist yeah. of this conversation. Yeah. And, you know, they say that it is lonely at the top. Mm. Yeah? Mm. As someone who has been at the top, I want you to I want you to talk to us about the people who have held your hand as you've been going up the top. Mm. The people that one you have been groomed together, yes, and also groomed each other. One of whom is one of my favorite leaders, who I also understand you won an award with uh, in 2018, 6 September, the African. Wow. <laughs> African Women <laughs> Leadership mm. Award. Mm. I've, written, I've written an article called uh, Dear Jennifer, I'm not happy. And I'm not happy because she's a great leader for Africa and not in Africa. Uh, but please pass her my, my, she, she did what she did. my regards. But yes, I want you to tell us that, that journey of people who groomed you and how yeah. important it, it has been for you. I am so privileged that I sat at the feet of and shared space with very generous people. You've mentioned Jennifer. I would also like to honor my first boss, uh, Dr. Professor Bachvinga, because if it was not for their generosity, I would not have been um, recognized. Uh, maybe they saw this in me and they gave me space. They gave me the space to grow, and because of that growth, they gave me additional uh, responsibilities. Of course, Professor Machiwinga left um, when I had more or less just joined, then Jennifer came in, and uh, yeah. So, generosity of people like those, the, the leaders that I worked with, I served with, uh, we, we, we did difficult things together, we cut our teeth at making difficult decisions, and, 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 and that grew, that grew me, that grew me, I'm sure they would also say that uh, they grew in the process, we were all strengthening our leadership muscle. So yes, um, Jennifer was my, my boss for, um, for quite a while actually, for quite a while, um, more than 10 years, more, more than 10 years and... I'm curious about what kind of boss she is. She, she, she was not a boss boss, the one that points fingers and commands. Of course you had the instructions, but she was the, the kind of leader that, that that sits with you and does things with you. But you, how can I call it? Um, you, you sit in this thing together. You sit in this thing together. We built that legal department to the level that it is. I'm proud to say that even as it is now, the shape and form it has now, we, we played a significant role in how it, it shaped and the attitude and the, you know, um, and what it delivers. So Jennifer, Jennifer is one of those people that I, I, I think was very instrumental in how I turned out as a leader, not because, uh, not only because of her leadership style, but also because um, she was, she, she is, I guess she was, the typical mother ego that, that allows you to, she throws you into something because she knows you can do it. So she would throw me into something, allow you to fly, pick you up when you're about to hit the ground, pick you up, show you the runs, you, you get back into it, she gives you another uh, obligation, you run with it, you do with it, she expanded me. I'm going to write that word, mother ego. Yes. So that will come back to you. And you need to, 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 to put 
put that in the context of how equals train yes, their young. Yes, yes, and star up the nest. Yeah, and star up the nest. So yes, because of that, because of that kind of leadership attitude, because and that's why Jennifer is a transformational leader. She was not she she was not the typical leader that that um, that that um, uh, she would she, she she leads by allowing people to to, to lead and thereby getting things done and uh, the heart is in it. The, yeah, so that's the kind of leader that Jennifer. A leader. Is. Uh, so what you're saying is. For you to be the leader you are, yeah. there was a leader who allowed you to lead. Absolutely. There is a leader that allowed you to lead. There is a leader that recognized that it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as you know, things exactly. get done. There is that saying, you can get so much done if you don't care who gets the credit. Speaking of Something credit. Something like that. Speaking of credit. People who don't hog all this attention and leadership who I am the boss and the boss everything does. Speaking of credit, mm. I, in, in, the, in the spirit of give honor where honor is due, mm. when I stand at my balcony there, mm. I see the URL building. You do? I From do. I, I'll show it to you. Really? And, and every time I see it, I'm like, Doris, mm. I, I did you led well. Add value. I added value. I added value. Congratulations. I added value to the real estate of Kampala. I added value to the real estate of Uganda. I'm glad you know it, <laughs> because other people would be would be trying to be modest and not recognize that actually well, this is important. Alone. I didn't do it alone. Yes. I didn't do it alone. I was I was uh, I picked the baton. There are people who started it. How does it feel to see to see a dream I give glory stand to like God. that? I give glory to God. I mean, it's it's not by our power, our might, but by His His own power that we are able to do that. But you know what's interesting? Now that you mention God. When the human beings decided to build the Tower of Babel, mm. that, I tell a joke that that's the one time God seemed to be threatened by human beings. That he, came, he had to come down to see what they were doing. Yes, and then he made a statement and said, do these people not speak one language? Mm. Are they not one people? Now this thing that they have done, mm. nothing will stop them, whatever they imagine. And it, he said something about the imagination of human beings. Yeah being unstoppable when there is unity of purpose. of purpose and also of time. Yes. And, and that brings me to this question. Before you go there, mm. uh, as, as, as part of the other discussion of giving honor mm. where it is due, Alan Kajina yes, is yes. another generous person that I sat at the feet of. These are women. Huh? These are women. I've, I've, I've only had one man. Yes, Professor Bachilinga was my first host, and uh, Jennifer came in, uh, Alan came in when I was head of, um, you know, the, 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 of course, during the whole transformation journey, she was mm. the CG, we were all under her, really, but at that time I was under Jennifer, then there was the time I was under Alan, directly under Alan. So, yeah, so, I mean, people like those, those are people who, I must say, they, they did light the spark of leadership, they enabled me to to, to grow my leadership muscle. Yeah, and let me say maybe they set the stage for, for, for what became later. So, um, in the spirit of generosity, what are you doing to play that forward? If you don't mind, like, um, how are you doing for others what was done for you? Yeah, um, deliberately looking out for opportunities that enhance uh, other people's opportunities. If you, when I come across something that I know some other young lady will benefit from, I point her in the direction. Some of them, it's it, it's it's about helping them see through the confusion in their minds. You know, dipping their toe in the water, and then you tell them it's fine. It may sound, it may feel cold, but once you immerse yourself in it, you get you, you get into it and you run with it and you'll succeed. Yeah, and of course, um, before before where I, I am now, there was that deliberate effort of empowering and 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 giving space, um, mm. giving space not only to the women, by the way, not only to women, um, because because it's it's not only about the women. Even there are so many gentlemen that grew because we gave them the opportunity to grow. Yeah, if it is true. Why is it lonely at the top? 
It's lonely at the top because of what I call, not I call, uh, it's a, I think it's a management or leadership philosophy. There's a halo effect. Uh, the titles that are given as a result of position authority create a halo. And because of that halo, there is a perception that is built around the persona of a leader. And that perception, more often than not, uh, creates distance. Unless you are deliberate about what is the word I'm looking for? Unless you are closing that, okay. that gap. If you are deliberate about closing the gap, then that distance becomes narrower, but there still is a distance. Um, it's lonely at the top because sometimes you have to stand alone in order for certain decisions to be made. Uh, leadership is about standing out from the crowd, and therefore, when you're a leader, sometimes or many times you will not behave like the crowd. And you have to be ready to do that. And again, it may create this is. It may create this is, and with this is comes pain. But that is the position of leadership. Uh, so that is one aspect of loneliness. Uh, loneliness at the top. Um, when you're a leader, it is assumed that you know a lot, and therefore people come to draw from you. Very few people come to plant in you. So you are for 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 all the time you you're giving, okay. you're giving. People are taking. If you, don't if, you don't do not, resource yourself, if you do not resource yourself, my goodness, you burn out. You burn out. So that's another aspect of loneliness, loneliness at mm. the top. Uh, in the sense that you are forever the... the, the uh, you know, like when you see these, uh, these water bottles that they put in the... The dispenser. In the dispensers. You're mm. the dispenser. <laughs> You're the dispenser. People come refill. with their cups and they do what? They take. They take. So there has to be another source which fills you up in order for you to be able to dispense. Which makes me ask, um, what, what people, if you can give you from your own example, what people then should a leader at the top surround themselves with? Because you see, when you're describing the gap, I was thinking, okay, how does one balance uh, reducing the gap and avoiding familiarity? Because, because again, familiarity breeds content. Mm. So how does a leader, which people should a, a leader bring close so that they remain grounded? Which leader should, which people should a leader have as a source of, of, uh, of inspiration? Does it have to be a PhD professor? Mm. Which people should a leader, if, if you could give you an example, surround themselves with to make that place at the top less lonely? I'll come at it from two dimensions, mm. maybe two or more dimensions. One, um, just this morning, and I think it's on my WhatsApp status, Will Smith is quoted to have said, we are all ignorant, only in different areas. It's true. So um, you must surround yourself as a leader, you must surround yourself with people who will give you knowledge in the areas you are ignorant about. But that also requires an acknowledgement that you're actually ignorant. Because now if you ask me about quantum physics, absolutely nothing, I, okay. I wouldn't know anything about quantum physics. But there might be some quantum physics concept that can help solve a certain solution, provide a certain solution. So I have to acknowledge, as a leader, I would have to acknowledge that I know very little about quantum physics and listen to the expert in quantum physics. And you can multiply that all around. So surround, the leader must surround themselves with people who are able to infuse them with knowledge in areas that they are ignorant about. And that goes in, the, in line with the principle of iron sharpening iron. Um, this gentleman who wrote about the seven... Covey. Covey, Stephen Covey talks about it sharpening the soul. So it's all along those lines. Sharpen the soul. Surround yourself with people who sharpen you, who will ensure that your iron remains sharp. Two, there must be people who know you before the title. Because these are absolutely people who have no fear to tell you off when you need to be told off. And we all need to be told off. Absolutely. There is nobody who doesn't need to be told off. 
So there have to be some people who must tell you off. And who the leader is obliged to listen to when they are being told off. So every leader has to have that person. I'm sure every person. leader has to has or must have. I think person. must have that must person. Have that person. And I'm sure all of us have people. You have people. You Whether we listen to them is, is, is a different. Is a different matter. But there is always someone that you, if they spoke, you listen. Yes. Yeah. If they spoke, you listen. So every leader needs to have um, a person. Surround yourself with people who can come and tell you, oh, see what you did. Uh -uh. Where they go. Where so I, I'd imagine at the C suit at the top there, if I had, if I was say in your, in your position, I'd like to have a T girl on my team, mm. the one who is delivering donuts and and biscuits to everyone in the organization. That person knows more than I can ever hope to know. Mm -hmm. I'd like that person close to me. Yeah. Uh, I would like the HR to not just be an HR. I'd like to be able to see the people beyond the titles, mm. like you said. And when we think about leadership, it's about moving people around visions. Yeah. And what is the HR's job if it is not to pick the right people for the work? And sometimes you as a leader who is not responsible fully for who is hired, mm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you reconcile mm. fitness for purpose against the people that you get in this pool as you're growing? Because there will be people who are detracting you, are pulling you back, who are, who are killing momentum. As a leader, you, you want to grow other people. How do you balance that? How do you choose whom to leave behind and whom to stick with? I think it's Jim Collins who said that uh, leadership is about getting the right people on the bus. Yes, yes. You must get the right people on, but you must also be bold to take the, right, the, the wrong people off. There has to come that point if, 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 if the, the, the wrong person is on the bus, Mm. And because of their presence on this bus, let's use another synonym. If there is a right, if, if we, if there is a wrong yeah. person mm. in the group, in the team, and because of their negative energy, their dishonesty, or whatever it is, their attitudes that are not congruent with the mission, the leader has to be bold enough to call that out. Um, and if there is no improvement. By virtue of being a leader, yeah, there is also an obligation of improving people because nobody is born into what they do. People learn and people grow in that space. So a leader also must allow people to grow in that space. But if there is no effort at improvement, then the mission is bigger than the person. So the leader has to be bold enough and brave enough and resolute enough to say um, thank you for all that you have done. But I think at this time, we need to perhaps, um, your time stops here. I mean, we, we, we can't go forward with you. So this is where you stop and it was nice knowing you. So that, that decision is part of leadership. That decision is also part of leadership. Even for the leader. Even for the leader. So um, yes, the, first of all, there is a recognition as a leader that we're dealing with people. We are dealing with human beings, we are dealing with people with hearts and souls and fears and baggage. So once you recognize that, there is some level of grace. But that grace must also not compromise the mission. True. Yeah, there is grace that must be extended to people to give them the training, give them the tools that needs them to be able to deliver. But if that has been provided and there is absolutely no effort at improvement, then the leader must make the call and say it's enough, it's enough, um, you're no longer a fit for the team and therefore you have to get off. Now you said, you said something about a leader having to surround themselves with people who knew them before the title. Yes. And, and that makes... That, that takes... Because of the halo that comes with the yes. title, yeah. So let's talk about the, the fabled corporate ladder that leads to the office that creates the halo. Mm. Yeah? I mean, when you say 19 years you are in an organization in obscurity, 
obscurity is a concept I've written about where you are in a place like a seed buried in the soil. No one even knows you are there until you come out or until you bear fruit. So I want you to talk to us as young leaders mm. about this corporate ladder. Mm. What lessons did you learn climbing this corporate ladder? I mean, 19 years in an organization. First of all, I must commend you on that because as a generation, I do not know many people who can be in one job for more than three years. Three years. Maybe even one year. Mm. So to be in an organization for 19 years in obscurity. It wasn't obscurity. I don't like the word obscurity. It was just that I wasn't in the limelight. Is that what obscurity means? Yes. You know, there is a... Um, you are there, but you are, you, when you, you don't when, recognize when, when you. When you, when, you, when you talk about a car, when you talk about a car, there are cogs in there. Yes. That if they were not there, there, there are certain things that the car would not be able to do. So maybe that's obscurity, I don't know, but... Um, Being comfortable with obscurity is, is something not many people understand. Remember how there is a leader who said, he must increase that I must. I, I must decrease that he, must, that he may increase. Mm. So obscurity is hard. Mm. You know, like for example, where you put in the work and someone else gets the credit. Mm. You see, that is an example of obscurity. It is yeah. not a bad thing. It's just something that every leader... Yeah. Goes through. Yeah. The, so the, the, let's talk about the ladder. The ladder, the, the, the corporate ladder. What is the corporate ladder? The corporate ladder has been given a bad vibe, in my view. It has been given a vibe of, Baganda would call it bound to. Mm, yeah. it's, a, it's it's cutthroat a business. Race, cutthroat. Climbing uh, that the ladder. The corporate ladder is a logical. Growth in a logical professional journey. Mm. That's what I want to define it as. You can't become the CEO if you haven't been a manager of a certain function, or you can't become, or you shouldn't become a CEO if you haven't had sufficient exposure to how this institution runs or how institutions run generally and the business around managing institutions because then you will you will not understand when the head of hr tells you a b c and d you will not relate or when the financial people come and tell you about the management report you will not understand the concepts they are talking about so a corporate ladder is that logical progression that allows one to be able to understand how this particular institution runs or how institutions run generally. They may be, you, you don't have to be in one institution to climb the corporate ladder. But it is, I think, I think it is, it is better if one scales the ladder uh, logically in order not to, to, to have too many um, disruptions. I want you to talk about the price, <clears throat> the price that, because when you talk about scaling it logically, mm. it means that one misstep and there is catastrophe. What are some of the, the things that people are doing to give, to give this climb a bad name and what can a young leader do to avoid some of these traps? And, and, and I'd, I'd, be, I'd be very happy if you talked as a woman. I can only speak about um, what I know. I can only speak about what I've lived through. Mm. I cannot speak about other people's experiences because I don't know them. Mm. But I would think that in order for, 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 for this growth to happen logically, first of all, there has to be hunger for knowledge. There has to be hunger for growth because that hunger for growth is what creates the ambition and it's the ambition which helps you to see the possibilities and opportunities beyond a certain level. Um, there has to be a commitment to continuous improvement because how you were five years ago, if you are still that way, then perhaps you're getting down. And, and if you do not commit to continuous improvement, then you will not be adding value. And scaling the corporate ladder is, is, a, is a function of people recognizing that you have value to add. And that mm. is why they choose you 
and bring you up uh, beyond other people. Um, growing, growing professionally, uh, growing professionally is also a function of knowing where you are going. Because if you don't have an idea of where you are going, I, I call it aspirational planning. If you do not aspire, then you can't plan to realize an aspiration. And therefore, growing professionally is, is a pathway or a tool in aspirational planning. So if you know that five years from now, I should be leading a division, then you will know that between now and five years, there are things I need to do in that time in order for me to be able to reach that level. So young leaders or people who aspire at leadership ought to set for themselves some kind of aspirational roadmap. And this aspirational roadmap is what would then guide how they navigate um, their professional journey and their growth experience in order for them to realize their aspirations. More often than not, that experience or that aspiration is going to be something higher than where they are. And that means logically you're climbing the ladder. And, and from what you said, it helps if there is someone up that ladder to pull you up. It helps if there is someone... Uh, they don't even need to be up at the ladder to pull mm. you up, but there must be someone that, who can even push you up. The team that you, you work with, the team that you work with, if they are supportive, then obviously they push you because leadership is about standing on the shoulders of giants. So there has to be these, these, these giants that are able to or willing to hold your weight mm. so that you can lead them. So... I want, you mentioned something earlier about uh, the mother ego mm -hmm. and, and uh, how she goes about growing her, her they're called eaglets. Yeah. That sometimes it comes to a place where she has to make the nest uncomfortable yes. for them to stay in. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes she has to pick them and throw them and push them out. And they discover mm -hmm. that they can fly. Before they are mid air, they didn't know that they could fly. I was listening to um, Honorable Lamini Zuma. I think she's the former African Union chairperson. Yes, and in 2014, they held uh, the African Union and uh, African Development Bank Summit mm -hmm. on, on leadership. And she said something almost to the effect that there is a need for women to be at the center mm. of the leadership conversation mm. because they bring a certain, <clears throat> a certain view to life mm. as mothers. Mm. And, and I've been saying this for a long time, that, for, that Africa needs the healing touch mm. of a mother's heart in leadership. And that's what I want us to talk about this. When you look at, for example, what's going on in Afghanistan, mm. uh, when you turn on the news, everyone is afraid mm. of how the Taliban are going to run their country. Mm. There, is, there is the return of, their, of the Taliban. That in itself is a problem. But now what everyone is watching and what everyone is waiting to hear is who is going to be the first woman that's going to be named in their, in their, in their cabinet, in their government. And that's what everyone is saying. Where are the women? Where are the women? And they are there, adamant. But who knows? They might, they might uh, succumb, to succumb to the pressure. pressure. Yes. But this is where the question is: What are we missing as a community, as a society, mm. when a woman's voice and a woman's touch is not considered in the conversation of leadership? How important is it? Because for me, I think this is more than emancipation. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, um, the, 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 the leadership theory, the leadership theory has postulated that the, the nurturing attributes of women when they come into a leadership conversation, a management conversation, because of, of, of how we are call it created to nurture, uh, we, we, we tend to make things grow. 
we tend to make things so by 90% they work better. <laughs> they, they say the results are always much better. I don't know whether it is because of the empathy, whether it's because of the the patience, whether it's because of that heart. Um, you all tend to look at this as, as babies and therefore you give them, you nurture them and they grow into big people. So there is that there is that aspect of the leadership theory that says that, and there, and and there is uh, sufficient evidence to prove it. I think we we we've seen all those reports. But also there are there are dimensions that women bring into these conversations that you men would never see. Of course. For example, and this is totally unrelated to to to, to leadership, but mm -hmm. I'll just use this as an example. Uh, there is, I'm a tax expert. I'm a tax expert. So in my chosen field of expertise, there is a concept called informal taxation. And informal taxation happens as a result of expenses that women have to pay as a result of being women. One of which is in these markets that we deal with in the markets. There's a toilet fee. Because men don't go to the toilet as frequently as women do, they don't pay as much as women do. So the burden of the toilet fee is heavier on women than on men, by virtue of anatomy of being a woman. I thought you were going to mention tissue. Men don't need to go to tissue. Good, good, the toilet All tissue. those are expenses. Yeah. That's, that's, that's men what did you call it? To go, it's informal taxation informal. In, the, in, the, in the area that I come from. Mm. So there are dimensions that women bring into the conversation. So a man would never bring into a discussion around toilet fees in a market, would never ever raise the issue of maybe we should never raise the fee, or maybe we should do away with the fees, or maybe we should um, provide tissues in, in the toilets because it's not their lived experience. And it's not because they are doing it deliberately, but by virtue of not being a woman, you will not know that a woman needs to use the toilet more frequently and therefore pays more. I once asked my father. So those, those dimensions that women bring into discussions, that women allow you, there are certain lenses in which we view things that maybe they are not being arrogant, maybe they don't know. Have you trained them? So that person doesn't, never does. Ever the report comes back with the same mistakes, I'm fed up, must fire him. So have you trained him in Microsoft Word? Have you trained him in PowerPoint? Maybe he just doesn't know how to do a PowerPoint. So there's a likelihood that the sixth sense really does exist. Possibly, yes. So I was saying when my dad told me, because at one time I sat down mm. and asked him, I asked him, wait, why is it that women naturally seem to live longer than men? They are more widows than they'll ever be widowers. And I was looking at my own experience, that my two grandparents, mm -hmm. my, my two grandmothers, one has outlived her husband, I mean, he died in 1976. What? And she's there, still growing strong, we're celebrating her birthdays every year. Mm -hmm. Then my other grandfather died in 1994, my other grandmother is still growing strong, mm -hmm. you know. So I asked him, well, what is the science here? His answer was simple. Mm -hmm. He said, someone else to remain to take care of the children. <laughs> But me, I, I thought that maybe it has something to do with the, with how easy it is for women to to adapt. to adapt. I say men are like strings, and women are like sponges. Yeah, okay. oh, sponges, okay. Like she, when they cry, mm. they create space. Mm. You know, they soak up so much. They soak up so much, and then they let it go. Then they have space for more more problems. Mm. But a man, there's only so far we can be stretched, yes, yes. and then we snap. Mm. So. What, what do you think about this? Because you've talked about anatomy. Now we're talking about psychology. psychology. You know? Yes. I, 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 maybe I brought it out in the patients, in the ability to see things differently from maybe how men see them. What you would call as a input to mm. maybe the woman would see it as a, a lack of skill and therefore provide the tool, provide the knowledge and when you give them uh, that knowledge, like I said, nurturing, nurturing, uh, maybe because many women have to deal with situations at home which require that absorptive capacity, 
it carries on through to the workplace and um, the, empathy, the empathy that comes with the feeling that I understand how you're feeling and maybe I'm ready to support you. I don't know, but there is also the, the intuition, there is also that intuitive element that has been ascribed to women leaders <clears throat> about maybe not taking risks that ought not to be taken. And going slow when you need to go slow. Um, maybe male leaders just make decisions like this. Maybe female leaders think about it a little bit more, ask for more information before they make a decision. And perhaps that could be uh, another reason why uh, women leaders are deemed to, 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 to post better results when they lead than when men are You know, just listening to your leadership journey, I realize that there is emancipation, that the, the, the leaders that have led you have mostly been women. Yes. Yeah? And then you are a very celebrated woman leader in, in, in my time. I want us to talk about the balance in this conversation of emancipation. Is it even necessary? Because why I say is it necessary comes from the point of view of, is that, isn't it common sense? How we still... Uh, segregating roles, how we still selecting roles dependent on gender, and really, ha does gender actually hinder a leader? It's still a very valid conversation because uh, culturally, societally, we are conditioned the way we are brought up, the, the, the culture in which we are, the space in which we live. The times in which we live, you remember saying time provides context. The, the time, the culture, the society, the religion, the everything contextually conditions us to ask. To even recognize that there is a gender issue. Mm. That a man versus woman. As, as a mother of sons. Yeah, as a mother of sons, um, I'm currently under obligation to my of course they're still very small right now they don't really know that uh, there is even gender there is even gender these are playmates they want but there'll come a time when they begin to recognize that hey there's a girl and there's a boy but the girl is the one who does the dishes for me when I eat I take the plate to the sink then the girl is the one who's called come and wash the plates and for me, as the boy, maybe I'm supposed to sweep the compound. So, how we condition the children in our homes also plays a very important role in that whole conditioning. It's a journey. It's never a destination. It's a journey, and it's a journey that we are on. It's a path that I believe we are on as a country and as a society. And yes, there are fit starts, fits and starts. Sometimes we slide. The NSSF board that was recently commissioned. For me, I think it's a slide. You make so much advancement, and then you slide. Then but you recognize that we slid, maybe people noticed it, maybe I'm, they didn't. I am glad that. But in our spaces, we say, mm -hmm, there we have slid back. Whether so that, someone that, will actually. It, have it's hardly balanced? You think? It's not even balanced. There's only one woman, and she's there because she's uh, from a trade union. So there was no deliberate choice about uh, choosing, ensuring that. Right now, the acceptable quota is 30 percent, and I believe even uh, almost all corporate boards are being appointed to ensure that there is a 30 percent quota. And it's 30 percent. We acknowledge it's still not 50, but it's still it's it's growth. You know what's interesting? But a, a board was recently commissioned. A board of 10 is it a board of 10 with one woman? There was absolutely no effort. I yeah, think. I see how you how you call that backsliding. But no, you know what's interesting? Mm. The the many boards that have uh, boardrooms that have sat in making presentations, or whatever. I've noticed something. Mm. Men are always outnumbered. Maybe not at the board, mm. but generally, when you look at the ladder, when you walk into an organization, even just look at a government, yeah, you find that. There has been a move of women into spaces which were originally men's spaces. 
yeah. from education to health to yeah. even at home. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So I find it, I, that's why I'm saying I still find it ridiculous that women still even have to fight. Because the truth is, they, are, they have a leg in, so mm. to speak. Mm. And maybe, because we talked about feminism earlier, even as we go on to the next, the next topic, that maybe feminism is a response to chauvinism. And when you think about chauvinism, male chauvinism, mm. you realize that it is a very misplaced and archaic concept in the 21st century. Feminism is a response to patriarchy. And patriarchy is not necessarily chauvinism. Chauvinism is uh, an, um, a, a deliberate mindset of, of, of male domination. How is that different from patriarchy? Patriarchy is an almost intangible but present acceptance that the gender conversation exists. You just said it, and you said it unconditionally. You, you didn't intend to. You said there is more women in spaces that were originally occupied by women. Amen. That alone is a patriarchal statement without putting a value judgment to it. Mm. Because it shouldn't matter. Exactly my point. Exactly. It shouldn't matter. And it should not even be an issue. But because there is that thing that even now we have more engineers, now we have more what? Mm. That is um, a recognition that patriarchy exists. And, 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 and people who are listening to me here should not misunderstand me. Patriarchy has no value judgment to it that oh, well, people are being patriarchal because they want to. No, 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 no. Maybe because we are African, maybe, but it's not only in Africa, even in the West. It is a the so called liberal deep -seated West. Seated it's quite issue. deep seated, and that is why you find conversations about equity and inclusiveness. Nowadays, that's a big, big ticket thing. And patriarchy is not only about gender. In fact, in the so called West, it's also about other things. It's also about so many other dimensions. Patriarchy is not about gender. But feminism is a response, I think, to patriarchy. Now, when you talk about women, men are outnumbered and whatnot, that's your lived ex experience. That's what you see because of where you are. But it is not representative. It is not representative. And therefore, there has to be more effort to, in, in, to encourage or, or to provide environment that creates equity to provide an environment that allows this, 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 this balance to come through. I like the word you've used, equity, not equality. Mm, yeah. Because, you know, here we are sitting on different sides of the table. You're a mother of sons. Mm. I'm a father of daughters. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And I have grown up in a generation where there has been a deliberate drive to lift up the, 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 the girls, the girls mm -hmm. which is part of the work that we do. Yes. For example, I showed you that we are preparing to skill young girls mm -hmm. in, in fashion design and tailoring and also mm -hmm. in recycling and, and urban farming. Mm -hmm. But don't you, do you sometimes think that what is happening to the boys? The boys. There is a saying, I don't know who, 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 who is credited with bringing it up, they say, but you're empowering all these women. <laughs> Where are the men who will deal with all these empowered women? So yes, I agree with you. Uh, we've had decades and decades of the woman empowerment agenda. It has created very empowered women. And emasculated men. It has also muted. And it's also a gender discussion. It's also a patriarchal discussion. It has muted the fact that there are boys now who are intimidated by empowered women. And these boys have grown up to be men. And that's why I say they're emasculated. Maybe they are not, but I don't know. Maybe they are not, but they, they you know, they, 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 they are... They may 
relates with these ladies from a view of, eh, mama, you, you are empowered. Can, can anyone uh, respond to you when you are empowered like that? You if get you don't it. have money, you can't talk to her. Uh, if you things. don't have money, that one, that one is, uh, you, you can't manage her. You get it. So that, that thing also has to be dealt with. Because then you're not going to have this, this uh, balance, parity. this parity we are talking about. And, and the baggage that, that, that comes with the women who are empowered and that whole effort of empowering women, that baggage that comes now on the other side is also not good. Because truth be told, a woman can be empowered, but it may be physically, I'm still weaker than the man. So a masculated man needs to show how powerful he is. And how does he take that out? Now, this brings us to this conversation. GBV. Um, GBV is a deep thing, but I, I, listening to you, mm. <clears throat> my, my simple answer as a solution is service. Serve one another, and there will not be gender. Serve one another, and there will not be a demand for who is who. Like, if I come to this table to serve you, you come to this table to serve me, as Every, humans. As humans. Everyone mm -hmm. is taken care of. No one feels less than. And so when, when, when leaders have postulated the, the concept of leadership being service, mm -hmm. I think it's true. And that's why I'm just now to, bring, to come to the final segment of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the dearth, the, the gap mm -hmm. in the African leadership. Uh, when you think about, for example, recently, last week, I think as recent as last week, there has been a coup in Guinea. Mm. And I was listening to the president's remarks on that when he was responding to a journalist from press from the French TV. And he said that those people have taken us years ba back. Mm. Like that is an ancient practice. Yes, yeah. yeah. Now when you think about the coups happening, and the, the political landscape is shaken. The, the president of, of, of Congo spoke against them, mm. and they gave him a very harsh response. And this is what they said. The cool leaders. Yes, and, and this was their response. Mm. Have you seen the streets? So how can you condemn this mm. when the streets are celebrating? celebrating. That is what, that's a, a very, very classic dichotomy. Mm. Then when you think about... Madagascar. Madagascar is currently facing famine, mm. having survived a coup mm. about a month or two back. Mm. So, when you think about all these things, with your experience in, um, with your experience in national basket management or uh, your, your, your time around national resources, because when I look at these things, especially the, the classic example of, of Sudan, where the president was overthrown because of the price of bread. Mm. I, I do not know how to bring it any clearer to finance than that. That the leadership crisis that Africa is suffering somehow can be traced back to how we have managed our past. I want to ask you a question as a leader, as a leader of Africa, speaking to us, the emerging leaders, where should we focus our resources as Africa? For all the money we are collecting, I, I don't know if you knew that, that Guinea is the second has a, the second largest iron, aluminium, and bauxite Deposit. deposits in the world. And I think they provide China with half of the aluminium that it imports. Mm -hmm. But the poverty levels on the street, mm -hmm. these are m a major disparity. Mm -hmm. So as a leader, how should we, the leaders of tomorrow, handle this? Where should we put our resources? That is a difficult question and I don't know whether I have an answer. I don't believe I do, but um, for me, I think that uh, 
leadership in in large part is about like i said uh before uh improving well-being improving well-being of the citizens so there are many definitions of how you improve the well-being of citizens but i i, I personally think that if people are economically improved if the economic well-being of people is improved all other things begin to fall in place when people have money in their pockets they are able to make good financial decisions uh, they are able to 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 invest and and produce uh, and because they produce their things that are sold and when things are sold there is more money and therefore wealth is created wealth of nations i mean the whole theory around wealth of nations but the people must want to be improved the people the people must want to be improved is there people who don't want to be improved or how the, how would that show up when you are hungry to improve yourself you will look for a solution you will not wait for a solution to be given to you and therefore you will be deliberate about exploiting opportunities around you that look you you say it um you into urban farming but how many on this street are doing urban farming for you it came as a result of saying i i, I don't need to buy greens or i don't need to buy vegetables i'll do it myself now can we scale that that thing that thinking to different things that i i i i, I shouldn't i shouldn't have to 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 wait for for give me an example i shouldn't want to to i shouldn't wait for for my divani for, for, for my divani to 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 start a program and 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 a drive start where you are improve yourself where you are don't litter don't 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 throw garbage on the street create a clean environment it it i mean sleep in a clean place um prevent mosquitoes from biting you so that you don't get sick and then you don't need to spend money you get it so that mindset of self improvement first <coughs> is is the evidence of people wanting to improve themselves and then as a result of having that mindset then 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 all these other opportunities you can tap into but from a leadership perspective i think it's also imperative to see where are the what are the metrics what are the metrics that 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 prove that you have improved the well-being if it is a health metric invest in health if it is a education metric invest in education if it is a market metric giving access to markets it do so if it's a production metric i think right now the 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 president is very very passionate about the social economic transformation of Uganda yes. and that's about making you more productive instead of just sitting back and and thinking the government will do everything you yourself what are you actually doing with the space you have so this social economic transformation mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. eventually also creates a a a mbera of okweyagala okweyagala yeah no yes so so and that is generally how it will be is improved i may be speaking idealistically i don't know but you know that is the way I would you say some things that i want to put this model to you and you just speak into it and then the final thing after you've spoken into this model is i'd like you to tell us and paint us a picture of what you see africa 50 years from today and i want you to speak into it let your idealistic lenses remain on mm. and paint a picture of the africa in which you see your sons because this vision will give us something to work with but even as you as as you think about what you tell us mm. uh, there is a model that I'm, I'm i'm developing actively i'll share it with you it's what i call the solution 6 eyes for transformation that these six things mm. if we understand them and we pursue this journey mm. any community will be transformed mm. 
the first idea imagination mm -hmm. imagination takes place through the story that people tell themselves and the education that they receive in that community mm -hmm. we as Africa have got to up the ante in the way that we imagine ourselves it always begins with imagination nothing you see here was not born in imagination mm -hmm. the second thing that should follow imagination is institutions there is no nation without institutions. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a house of cards. Okay. So the second I is institutions. When you have institutions, ideally then you can invest in infrastructure. That would be the, th the, the third I. Of, yes, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you a story uh, about how my fashion business crashed. I got a job for a client who turned out to be Ministry of Energy uh, to do uniforms for them for the, mid, for the energy week of 2016. Mm -hmm. Now, in the process of producing a Monchiembe, electricity goes. Mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, no Thursday, power. there was no power. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get the embroidery done in time. Yeah. So I was able to deliver the uniforms only at 6.30 p.m. The deadline was the deadline was five on what was supposed to happen at five was a picture the picture to launch the energy week so I was late for the picture why was I late for the picture because I didn't have power but who was my client Ministry of Energy the irony of that has never been lost on me so I'm talking about infrastructure now once you have infrastructure then we can innovate innovation. Every country, recently we watched two rich men throw money by going to space and coming back. Mm. That's innovation. Mm. It is something to aspire to. Yeah. But you can't have innovation without infrastructure and institutions. Now, after you have an imagination, once you have those four, then you can look for investment. Because there are investable ideas. There are institutions that, can, that will protect capital. And when you have investment, then we can have industrialization, which is what we want. For me, I believe that these six eyes mm. is the journey to Africa's transformation. And I, I, I want to share that with, with you as a leader. If you have something to say, to say to it, especially as you tell us how you see Africa mm. 50 years from today. Paint us a picture. I think I, my, my view of Africa. We are busting, we are about to break forth, we are about to bring forth, um, there's so much promise, there's so much, uh, there's so much uh, of, 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 I don't know whether to call it even, we are at the threshold of triumph, let me call it triumphing. Uh, over, over all whatever has kept us beyond. And that's because of things to do with the ideas you're talking about, this huge imagination with a lot of talent. There's so much openness now, eyes have been opened. There's so much, we're bursting at the seams. And, and, and this is, by all means, whether you like it or not, it is just going to happen. Now, we, we must be ready for it. We must be ready for it. And, and I, I believe that the generation of Africans that are going to carry this through um, is already available because of technology, because of, you know, I mean now, this, this, look, he's, he's on the phone, he's, he's stuck into a world that is you and me, maybe you, but me certainly at his age, there was no way I could do that, that he does. So the generation, this is a generation of people that are actually going to deliver this triumph. And it's not even 50 years. Now imagine with a promise that comes with people like him. What about the ones that are coming after? Okay? The ideation, the, it's just, the, and you see what is going on in Uganda. Now Uganda is just one country in Africa. Multiply that by the 54 and maybe those that will come through later. We are, we are bust, we are just about to break through. The that, world, that also the, sounds like a very treacherous time. 
Like, mm. but this is a, it's a time to be managed. That, that's what it's I'm thinking. It's a time to be managed, but that is all part of the process. It's all part of the process. The thing at the end of that whole process is going to be magnificent. Now, we as Africans must be ready to, to, to make way for it. And therefore, there are certain things that inhibit our progress, or which would typically inhib inhibit our progress, we need to throw those out. Mentalities of, of inferiority, uh, mentalities of waiting to be supported, uh, culture, we have a lot of cultures that are not. Yeah, what I would like to tell the world is that um, we, 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 whatever it is you want to do, whatever it is you set out to do, do it. Just start. Um, the, the, the journey to success, there cannot be any success without starting. So cut out whatever limiting beliefs that may be inhibiting you, things that you think um, you're not worthy, you're not able, you're not qualified, you're not old enough, you're not young enough. Just do it, like Nike says, just do it. Start, and it is in starting that one grows. That fits you. Nobody promised that there will not be fall. Falling, falling comes with growing. There is no child. Uh, we who are all here, we once were babies and we, we, we crawled. We stood up, we fell, we stood up again and walked. So yes, falling happens. It's all part of the journey. But once you grow, you stand tall and then you grow. And at the end of the day, you actually triumph. So for me, that is the way I would say it. Leadership starts with self-leadership. Take charge of your own growth. Take charge of take charge of your own. Be a master of yourself. Be the CEO of your life and take decisions that CEOs take on your own life. Invest in yourself, but cut out, um, decommission certain things as a CEO would do in a typical organization, and take charge of your own life because. Self-leadership is the beginning of all other types of leadership. Yeah. Wow. I have a challenge for you. Please give me that book. I want to write this book out to your sons. So, if you would tell me their names. Mutamani wa mgaya avu Siri 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 muzukuru wa mwanda Siri Mze Siri Jajange chintu Tata buntu Chintu we untu ulamu 